Welcome to Links and Locks Action Network's Golf Betting Podcast presented by Bet365. I'm your host, Andy Lack, and I'll be joined alongside Action Golf contributor Tony Sartori for these Best Bets episodes. And just like Jason and Ben have done the last couple of years, Tony and I will play 18 holes today, giving our 18 favorite picks for this week's tour event, the RBC Heritage. Before we dive into this week's episode, a reminder that the Links and Locks Podcast is presented by Bet365. Bet365 does not do ordinary. That's why you get more boosts with them than with anyone else. Every day they power up the odds on hundreds of bets to give you a chance to win more. Bet365 boosts specific markets, your winnings, and even parlays, and they don't stop there. Keep an eye out for their biggest and best odds with the incredible super boost. Check out the boost and see why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 21 or older and present in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, North Carolina, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, or 18 and older in Kentucky. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. Okay, Tony, we are on the first tee here for our Heritage Best Bets. Get us started. All right, so I'm going to go after a guy that was actually in the news today, and I placed this before the rumors started circulating. But um, towards the top of the leaderboard, I'm going to go after Rory McIlroy at 12-1 to 1 at Bet365. So as before this whole live thing, I'm not sure how um, truthful those rumors are. It came out of that uh, financial reporting like column out of London. So how truthful that is remains to be seen. I find it very, very hard to believe he'd go such like a polar switch like that. But... Who knows? Either way, he's still slated in the field this week. Still going to tee it up. And um, I just think that number 12 to 1 is a, kind of a good number to buy low on Rory. Um, we're catching 12 to 1 because Rory has struggled out of the gate this season, no doubt. But he's starting to round back into form with six straight top 25 finishes, including his third place finish at the Valero Texas Open. His ball striking has picked up immensely since that poor start. And that'll be important this week at a course uh, like Hilton Head, where approach shots towards uh, the small greens are essential to success. McRoy has gained true strokes on the approach in five of his past six tournaments. The putter's also been good. He's been so well-rounded game. We know, obviously, he's known for the driver. So, I mean, if you strain together driver, irons, and putter, then there's no flaw in the game. So, at 12-1, to 1, as he continues to trend upward, it's just a number where, like, if Rory does go out and just dominates this week or at least gets a win, I don't think we see 12-1 to 1 again on him for a while. Godspeed, my friend. I'll uh, I'll invite you to the next Rory support group meeting if uh, <laughs> if things don't go your way. I, that's typically what I'm used to when I bet Rory McIlroy. But I'm going to go to a uh, another typical familiar face for us on uh, on this podcast, and I'm going to go with Xander Schauffele, twelve to one enhanced win group player. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I remember when Xander coming into the 2022 U S open at Brookline Xander was very popular. I picked him that week. A lot of folks picked him that week. It felt like a phenomenal course fit. And he did pretty much exactly what he did at this year's masters, which was play great gain strokes in all four major categories, but never really have a chance to win the golf tournament. And then the following week after the 2022 U S open, a lot of people hopped off. A lot of people said Xander, He's not that guy. He's not a closer. He can play great in top 10 every single week, but he's not a winner. What did he do the next week? He won at short odds on a short positional Pete Dye golf course. And I feel like there is something a little bit synonymous about the opportunity that we have this week with Xander at the Heritage. I know that he was a popular play last week. He did nothing to disappoint other than not win. He played great. He cashed an easy top 10 for us. And now he returns to a golf course that uh, he gained over 12 strokes ball striking out last year. So, you know, there are a lot of 14 to one Xander at the master's bets last week. Um, give me 12 to one at the heritage 10 times out of 10, not having to deal with any of the live players having to deal with Scotty and at least what we should hope for to be a natural letdown spot coming off a master's win with, you know, one week closer to his first child. I think this is, it's very Xander-esque to win a lesser event than a major the week after everybody pencils him in to win a major. And I just feel like something in the air with, something is in the air with Xander right now where he's just playing too good to not win one of these smaller ones outside of Scotty Scheffler. He has been bar none, the most efficient player in golf at getting the ball in the hole in 2024. So I'm going to go with Xander Shoffley 12 to one to win the RBC heritage. 
Yeah, he's he's absolutely due. I could absolutely see him winning this week. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit further down uh the lead or the odds board in the outright winner market. I'm gonna go after Wyndham Clark, who is at thirty to one, and I'm not really sure what the hell Clark has done to go back down to like the thirty to one range. This is a U.S. Open champion and one of the world's best golfers, and he's the one. Yeah, he hasn't it hasn't gone quite as well very recently, but just a f month ago, he was the only one that was competing with Scheffler at the or. He was consistently competing with the, with Scheffler at the top of leaderboards, more, more consistently than anyone else in this field. I think recency bias has just inflated this line. Clark is not a 30-1 to 1 golfer. Um, and, yeah, he didn't play well last week at the Masters, but and he missed the cut. But the course was kicking everyone's ass, and anyone could have – anyone of his stature can still struggle when the course is playing that difficult. Hilton Head will not play that diff – or as difficult this week. So I think at 30 to 1 is a good, like Rory, a good buy low spot and a guy who's just way too good of a golfer to be at 30 to 1. I'm going to stick in that same range of the odds board and pick a player, uh, again, that has yet to get that big breakthrough win for us that I get suckered into all the time. And this week is no different. I'm going to go with Cameron Young at 30 to 1. We were on him last week at the Masters. He played great, he finished ninth. Uh, he drove the ball incredibly well. He putted incredibly well. He hit his irons great as well. And the short game seemed to ail him at Augusta National, which was the concern coming in. These are going to be much more benign green complexes for Cameron Young to tackle. And I know he gets the label as a bomber. His driver is his biggest weapon, but he's actually had a lot of success on the shorter positional golf courses that sometimes take the driver out of play for him. I mean, the thing that we forget about with distance is even on a golf course where a lot of players are clubbing down, the fact that Cameron Young can hit a two iron 250 yards is still going to be tremendously helpful on a golf course like Harbortown. I'm there right now. Um, Carolina golf, it is a lot of overhanging tree limbs. It helps to have that distance and accuracy with your less than driver clubs. And I am not surprised that he has played great at golf courses like heritage in the past, played great at golf courses like the Valspar in the past and in their Carolina style course. Um, I love the way that he's hitting the ball right now. I think he is incredibly close to a win just based on his ball striking. I'm very confident that he will be there. So give me Cameron young at 30 to one to win the RBC heritage. Love it. He's been playing really good golf. Um, so I was, I just did two buy low guys and now this is going to be kind of a outright winner that I'm going with. That's more of a trend play. And that's Corey Connors at 50 to one. Whenever we get a course like Hilton had that rewards approach players, I immediately go to see where's Connors on the odds board. And he's one of the best ball strikers on tour who is often held back because of his short game. But those troubles, you can get away with those troubles at Hilton head. Cause it's really just how good is your approach? Can you hit the small greens and then work from there? It's not shocking, therefore, it's not shocking that Connors has made the weekend each of his past four years here. He finished 12th in 2022, 4th in 2021. This is just an approach player's golf course, and Connors is, by definition, an approach golfer. So this is his game. The course sets up nicely for him, which is why he's 50 to 1, which is a little lower than I'd like to see for a guy like Corey Connors. But the reason it's 50 to 1, um, only 50 to 1, is because this course is built for his success. So we'll see if he can sneak one out at 50 to 1. I'm going Corey Connors. I love that play. Uh, I will get to Corey Connors a little bit later on in the episode. Actually, might as well just do it now. Um, I have him at top 20 plus 125. Um, I'll circle back to some of my top 10 bets, but. You already brought up Connor, so I might as well highlight him here as well in the top 20 market. I am being a little bit less ambitious with Connors this week just because I continue to have so many concerns about his short game and putter, and I'm not sure if I trust him enough to win a golf tournament with the way that he's putting right now. But I think that on this golf course, the type of golf course that emphasizes driving accuracy uh, and middle iron play, I think you can pretty much just lock him in for a top 20 at this style of course that completely emphasizes the type of things that he does well. Right. And it has not been a surprise to see him play well at so many of these other West and driver positional golf courses. So I thought it was wild in a field of what I believe is 69 players this week without a cut to get plus money on Corey Connors, who you even mentioned has the upside to do a lot better than that. Give me Corey Connors plus plus one twenty five to finish in the top 20. Absolutely. Glad we're on the same page on that one. And then for my last outright winner uh, pick, 
I'm going to go with Denny McCarthy at 80 to 1. So this is, I'm pretty much just going to contradict everything I just said about how, like, you can get away with uh, mediocre putting if you're a good approach player. McCarthy's obviously always been dependent on that putter, and it, his success comes can he dial in those irons and hit the greens when he needs to? Because we know his putter can always bail him out. But I think just with what he did against Akshay, yes, he lost that playoff against Akshay, but he played brilliantly over the weekend at the Valero Texas Open. He was 20 under. He was gaining strokes in every category across the board, including the ones where he traditionally does not fare as well in the ball striking department. Whenever you have a guy who's as good of a putter as Denny, you're, the floor is high, right? So it's like, where can we go? Because the putting can always bail you out. But where are you going to go if your irons start to like sharpen or you get better iron play? And I think his iron play has improved this season, which is why he's made the weekend 12 of his past 13 tournaments. So I like the high floor, but where can he go from here? At 80-1, to 1, I think it's definitely worth a dart throw with that increasingly good iron play that we have seen thus far. So Denny McCarthy at 80-1 to 1 is my last outright winner pick. Uh, I love that play. Uh, he can always get super, super hot with the flat stick, as we mm -hmm. saw at the Valero Texas Open recently. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to go with Siwoo Kim. Top 10, plus 280. Um, Siwoo Kim has four wins on the PGA Tour. Three out of those four wins have been at short positional golf courses. Uh, two out of those four wins have been at Pete Dye golf courses. He is just on the Mount Rushmore of short positional Pete Dye types of courses and architecture. He has won the Players' Championship. That's a Pete Dye short positional course. Uh, he has won the Wyndham Championship. That's another Carolina-style short positional golf course. Uh, he has won the American Express. That's a Pete Dye golf course. Uh, and I want to say that his final win was at the Sony Open. That's right, at YY, another short positional golf course that emphasizes accuracy off the tee and middle iron play. Should not come as a surprise that he also has a runner-up at the Heritage before um, so I just think you play Siwoo Kim on this style of architecture. This style of architecture plays right into the types of things that he does well on, on a golf course, which is keep the ball and play off the tee, hit your middle irons well. He's got a great short game, a really underrated short game as well. So I'm going to go with Siwoo Kim plus 280 to finish top 10. Love it. I was looking at Siwoo Kim a lot this week as well. I'm going to keep us in the top 10 market. I'm going to go a little deeper on the odds board i'm gonna go at plus 750 for lucas glover so i'm so glad you just said the wyndham championship because he won that last year and he followed that up with a win at the fedex st jude championship which so the first of those wins shows that he can win on the style of course the second of those wins shows that he can take down a field that's going to be as competitive as he will face this week so the profile is there this is probably my favorite bet on the board, not because like 17 2 is not a gimme number by any means but i think it's mispriced and that's definitely because Glover has not finished inside the top 10. I think he might have once since those two wins, but he has not done so this season. But what he did with those wins is show he can win at this style of course and he can win against this comp level of competition. But the reason I love him the most this week in like kind of a buy low spot is he's been a ball striking machine recently, despite the underwhelming results this season. He's gained true strokes on the approach in, in each of his past eight tournaments. And he made the weekend in seven of those past eight outings and has finished inside the top 25 in each of his past three. So he's starting to find that form again that we saw at the end of last season where he got those two wins. So if you're giving me plus 750 on a guy who's definitely trending the right direction at a course where he can definitely succeed at, then yeah, I'm going to take a shot on Glover at plus 750. Love that play. I'm always a huge Lucas Glover fan. He has been uh, very kind to me this year in the positional markets. I'm going to go right back to the top 10 market and go with Brian Harmon top 10 plus 350. Uh, I think you're getting a really good buy low option on Harmon this week. I know that he played poorly at the masters and missed the cut. Uh, I expect him to bounce back this week at a golf course that is far more his speed. What was his best finish of the year? Of course, it was a runner up at the players championship, another less than driver Pete Dye golf course. He's played really well at the heritage in the past uh and he has the exact type of skill set that you would want I, I believe he's won the sony open as well but he's just had so much success on these driving accuracy strategic golf courses i know that this is not going to sound anything like 
Harbor Town, but what was the objective at at Royal Weather Liverpool this year? Uh, it was to keep the ball in play off the tee and avoid all of those devious, devilish little pop bunkers. Um, I just like Brian Harmon on these style of golf courses that de-emphasize distance, um, place more of that emphasis on accuracy, and and allow him to scramble and and does what he do, does best, which is attack smaller greens, really good short game, keep the ball off in play off the tee, um, grind on these style of golf courses. And I, you know, I would not put too much stock into Brian Harmon missing the cut at Augusta. That is always going to be a pretty tough situation for him. That's a, a way bigger ballpark that a lot of things are going to have to go right for Harmon to really play well at Augusta. I think the roadmap to success at Harmon is on Harmon is is a lot easier, and you're getting a lot of value here based on two poor rounds at a golf course that uh, wasn't really the best course fit for him. So Brian Harmon, top ten plus three fifty. I'm gonna keep us in the same market as well, and one more dart throw before I go back to a couple chalky picks to round us out. But I'm gonna go Nick Taylor, top ten at plus eight fifty, and I'm going after this play in the same vein that I went after Danny McCarthy in the outright market, and it's like. I get why the number is so long, right? He's known for his putting, and it's it's a question of whether or not the iron play is going to be there. But the reason why I like him this week is because he has gained true strokes on the approach in nine of his past 10 tournaments, and that included a win at the Phoenix Open, which was also among a very strong field. So like McCarthy, when you're such a good putter, the floor is there, and it's when you can elevate yourself is when the irons are dialed in. Right now, his irons have been pretty good, so I think at plus 850, if the iron play can continue to improve in the same vein as McCarthy, then I think Nick Taylor absolutely possesses the tools to find himself towards the top of the leaderboard come Sunday. Love that one. I'm going to go into the top 20 market now for this one uh, and go with JT Poston, plus 145, top 20. Just another course history king, and and we haven't talked about it a lot yet this week, but this is one of the stickier course history courses on the PGA Tour. What is the reason for that? This is a very specific style of golf that you don't see too often week to week on the PGA Tour. PGA Tour, it's a lot of driver wedge, and this is a golf course that truly takes driver out of your hands and forces you to make decisions off the tee. And JT Poston has just been incredible at this golf course. He's got three top seven finishes already. He's won the Wyndham as well. We go back to the Wyndham once again. He's another winner of that tournament in the past. Uh, he played quietly pretty good at the Masters too, uh, which I think, we could both agree is not a great fit for him. And I think just like we talked about with Brian Harmon, this golf course will be way more his speed. So I'm going to go with JT Poston top 20 plus 145 to record another strong finish at Harbor town. Absolutely love it. I'm going to go to the first round leader market. So as always, I'm waiting to actually lock these first round leader plays in until tea times are announced. So keep an eye out for my first round leader article here this week at the action network. But with that said, as long as these next three guys I'm about to rattle off as we continue aren't like I'm on the last groups out, then this is the direction I plan to head in. And the first guy is reigning Masters champion Scotty Scheffler. Look, the thing is, I don't think I'm going to have a card where I'm not betting Scheffler in some shape, way, or form as we round out the rest of the season. I'm done missing out on what seems to be just free money at this point, Who uh, and a guy who is not only now the best golfer on the planet, undisputedly, but he is now, like, he's starting to reach the potential of prime Tiger, prime Jack Nicholas level of golf. And um, the reason I wanted to first-round leader market for him specifically this week is, one, the number is a lot longer. It's 11-1 to versus 4-1, to which makes sense because it's a smaller sample size, so more volatility, but he can take down any round at any time. But two, we again have to worry about the whole child thing, whereas if his he could leave the course at any time this week if his wife does go into labor. So that's another reason I kind of feel more confident, just like, can we get through Thursday with him? I feel more confident that than if we can get through Sunday. Whatever happens, whatever happens. You know, he still, he still could withdraw from the turn before it even starts. But um, at 11-1, to 1, Sky Sheffield, that's just a way to back a guy who is, even if he does not the first-round leader, I'm sure he'll be up there. Love that. I'm going to stick in the first round later market as well for a player that, frankly, a little surprised we haven't mentioned yet, and that's Patrick Cantlay. Patrick Cantlay has been unbelievable at this golf course. He really started to turn things around at the Masters as well. I was a little pessimistic about Cantlay's chances heading into Augusta, and you know he finished T22. He didn't do anything crazy, but it was really the iron play 
that caught my attention. I saw him on Wednesday night grinding harder than anybody in the entire field that week with his coach late. He was the last one on the range on Wednesday night. Um, him and Vijay Singh actually were the last guys on the range grinding on their swing on Wednesday night. And I know that the results were a little bit underwhelming. T22 isn't going to be anything to write home about for a player of Patrick Cantlay's resume. But I think the so he started to show some legitimate signs, particularly with his approach play. This is one of his best approach performances of the entire season uh, in a year where his irons have actually been his biggest bugaboo. Um, he's had a strong tendency as well to come out of the gates hot in round ones. He's played great in round ones all throughout the season. He's third in this entire field in strokes gain total in round ones uh, this year. So I think the combination of the iron starting to round to deform his ability to get off to a hot start in round ones, uh, coupled with the fact that he's just been unbelievable at this golf course and Pete Dye golf courses in general. So I'm going to go with Patrick Cantlay, 22 to one in the first round leader market. Love it. If there was ever a get right course for Cantlay, it would certainly be this week. Um, and so I'm going to keep us in the first round leader market and I'm going to go after Ludwig Oberg at 20 to one. We talk about him all the time, pretty much every week, but he's the next guy up. And we saw that on Sunday with the Masters. He was really the only one, well, really no one was contending with Scotty by the end of it, but he was the one who gave him his best shot on the back nine on Sunday. Um, and the reason why I think that's really important for this week is we talked about, or you talked about earlier, and it's definitely true, Hilton has notoriously known for being a course where previous experience matters, but so is Augusta. And that was Oberg's first appearance there in his career, and he was awesome, especially over the week, or especially on Sunday. And so if he can do that at Augusta with the way that course was playing, I think he absolutely can come out and fire on Thursday, despite it being his first competitive round ever at Hilton Head. He's a generational, or looks like he's about to be a generational talent. 20 to one first round leader. I think there's just worse place to, there's just worse guys to back every single week than Oberg. Love that play. Uh, I can confirm after watching a lot of him up close, he is he's simply built different. He is really, uh, the, really good. The sound that it it makes coming out of the club face, it reminds me a lot of, of 2012 Rory. Um, I'm going to go with another player that I don't know if he's built quite like Ludwig, but I certainly believe that he is a tremendous talent um, and his best years are ahead of him on the PGA Tour. And he started to show some legitimate real flashes uh at the masters last week contending in not you know i don't know maybe contending is a bit of a generous word but he had a really really strong performance at the masters i'm talking about cam davis um cam davis is 45 to 1 first round leader he's another player like patrick cantlay that raises his baseline in round ones He's got some really strong history at the Heritage as well. Three top 25s in all three finishes. I think he's another player like Cam Young, where sometimes um, when you take the driver out of a bomber's hands uh, and, and force them to club down a little bit, which they will still have an advantage because of their length and how accurate they will be able to be with their driving irons. Sometimes that's a good thing because Cam Davis is awfully long, but he's also awfully wild. Um, so forcing him to play a little bit more strategically off the tee has played paid dividends for him at the past. I mean, he has had a ton of success, not just at the Heritage, also at Pete Dye courses. Uh, he's played great at the Amex before. He is a sixth place finish at the players in the past. Uh, and like I said, I just like to target those guys that seem to come out of the gates hot and raise their baselines in round one. So give me Cam Davis, 45 to one in the first round leader market. I love that. That's a really sharp play. I really like that. I'm going to, for my last play, I'm going to stick in the first round leader market. I'm going to go after Tommy Fleetwood at 28 to 1. I always love taking Fleetwood in the first round leader market over his full tournament market because the guy feels like he's cursed at this point on American soil. Um, no other explanation for why a guy of this talent has not won yet over here. But he's in great form. He just finished third at the Masters and what was a great performance last week. Finished seventh the week prior at the Valero Texas Open. So he's dialed in right now. He's gained he gained true strokes on the approach in each of those events, which will be key to success this week. Fleetwood has also made the weekend here in three of his uh, four career appearances, finishing inside the top 25 in all three of those made cuts. So at 28 to one, especially with how well he played on Sunday, can he carry that momentum into Thursday at 28 to one? I think it's worth a shot that he does. Love that. Uh, Fleetwood's another player that I am a huge fan of this week that just 
missed my card. So I'm glad you found some exposure to him so we could highlight him in this show. Uh, I'm going to finish us off with a bit of an unlikely bet that I don't usually make, but they didn't have mass. They didn't have matchups posted on, on bet 365 by the time that I was making this outline. So I was looking at some more fun, interesting bets and, um, I'm going to go with no hole in one minus 200. And and I'll tell you why I've got some reasoning on that. I, I know that minus 200 is not a bet that a lot of golf bettors like to swallow. I, I could just tell you there are guys that make a living in Vegas betting these minus 200 plus EV bets at the Super Bowl. This is their bread and butter and their favorite type of play. So I promise you before golf bettors, you stick your nose up at it. Um, there's a lot of logic to this. Harbor Town, I am staying with a family this week covering the event that uh, goes to the Heritage every year. Uh, I asked them about the golf course. They said the number one that's thing that sticks out is the difficulty of the par threes. Um, the statistics back this up as well as the par threes at the Heritage are hands down the toughest aspect of the course raking top 10 every single year in difficulty um the none of these par three holes are gimmies we rarely see hole to one hole in ones every week on the pga tour to begin with i think this is a bet that a lot of players like to bet yes on and you can simply take advantage of the fact that it just does not happen as much as people want to think that it happens particularly on golf courses with such a hard as part of a set of par threes as the heritage. So I'm going with minus 200, a nice little, nice little bank bankroll builder. Um, one that, you know, may put me in, in cardiac arrest watching throughout the week. It's probably not the most fun bet to sweat, but I promise there's value in it. Um, and it's a, it's cer certainly a, a, a brain play over a fun play, but, um, but I think everybody has fun when there's more money in their wallet at the end of the day. So you've minus 200. You've convinced me. I'm riding with you on that. Yeah. I'm going to take that as well. You've convinced yeah. me. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it, it just doesn't. I know it's fun to bet the yes side on these, mm -hmm. but you got to look at it like the Super Bowl props. And yeah. the guys that bet the no's and the Super Bowl props are the ones that end up cashing every single year. So I'm going with minus 200 no hole in one and that will do it for our best bets episode before we get out of here a final reminder that the links and locks podcast is presented by bet 365 as a reminder bet 365 doesn't do ordinary that's why you get more boosts with them than with anyone else every day they power up the odds on hundreds of bets to give you a chance to win more bet 365 boost specific markets your winnings and even parlays and they don't stop there keep an eye out for their biggest and best odds with the incredible super boost check out the boost and see why it's never ordinary at bet 365 must be 21 or older and present in arizona colorado indiana iowa louisiana north carolina new jersey ohio virginia or 18 and older in kentucky gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in iowa Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. As a reminder, our action experts, Spencer Aguiar and Nick Brettwish, return with host Roberto Arguello tomorrow. This will be our RBC Heritage betting preview right here on the Links and Locks podcast. So for Tony Sartori, I'm your host, Andy Lack, and we'll see you back here next week on the Links and Locks podcast presented by Bet365.